All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, Internet. Those of you that are signed in, we'll uh, hope you enjoy. Grab your Bible, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, uh, another lesson in Proverbs as we have begun this series, and we'll work our way through uh, the book of Proverbs for a while, and hopefully you're enjoying it. We'll slow down just a little bit from last week and uh, go at a little bit slower pace and try to not cover so much, and uh, hope you're enjoying this study. It's uh, the series title is called The Way of Wisdom, and of course the uh, Proverbs is considered the book of wisdom, and it's always a good thing. It was uh, just down-to-earth kind of stuff, and we're going to see that. Tonight we're going to be looking at wisdom for living. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless this study uh, as you grab your Bible. Father, we would ask tonight that you just meet with us. We still wonder why all this must take place, but Lord, we know you have a perfect plan in all this. Lord, if it would be our will, we would all be meeting here and the kids would be running through the building. Father, but you had a purpose in this, and I pray, Father, that you would help us to, at some point, be able to see just the blessings that you've allowed us to have during this time. Thank you for technology. We thank you for giving us people that know how to operate. We thank you for Bud and Bree tonight, and as they uh, remotely take care of all these things. We thank you, Father, for uh, our folks that are tuning in so faithfully. Thank you those that are uh, figuring out ways to continue to be con connected with our church, and we thank you for that, and Lord, I pray that you'd just bless, and Lord, we do look forward to the time that, that we'll be able to meet together, but in the meantime, and, and of course at any time, Lord, we need wisdom, and we need wisdom to live, not just the world's wisdom, but the biblical principles that you lay out through the book of Proverbs. Help us to study now in Jesus' name, amen. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 2. And we will start at uh, verse number 1 and go through verse 11 tonight. I'm not sure we'll get all the way through, but uh, we'll make an attempt at it. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 2, starting there at verse number 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous, he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment, and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. You know, in the Bible we're often encouraged and even commanded to be very systematic in our approach to studying the things of God. I mean, in, in theology, in the study of theology, they have one whole thing. It's called systematic theology. There's a system, uh, you know, one precept upon another. It's to lay it out. If you look at our Constitution and bylaws in our statement of faith, it is systematically laid out. And what that means is we give you a topic, so to speak. We believe this, and then we add all the verses so that if you wanted to, we will study. At some point, I really believe God will allow me to preach through our statement of faith, and we'll study that out in detail and why we chose the verses that we chose. But God is very systematic in, in our approach to studying things, uh, especially when it comes to uh, topics such as wisdom here. You know, God shows us that he is a God of order. I mean, you know... There's no question when you get to heaven, if you ask God, now, God, which came first, the chicken or the egg, he'll, have a, he'll not only have the correct answer, but he'll tell you exactly why it happened the way it happened. And, and, and of course, you know, there will be no ambiguity. There will be no uh, question marks. It'll be there because God is a God of order. These things have to happen before something else can happen. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, uh, Becky and I, we've been doing a little bit of baking lately, and we've come to realize that, you know, baking is, is just like cooking, except you're not supposed to throw stuff in. You're supposed to follow. It's a sign. And one thing has to go before the other, and if you get ahead of the game, it can turn out pretty disastrous, and you try to tuck it into a trash can, and hopefully nobody will see it later on. 
And, and because God does everything in, in an orderly way, we see that God is wisdom. I mean, if you, just, if, if you don't get anything at all out of the lesson over the next few weeks, if you would just get that, that God equals wisdom, you'd be so far ahead of the curve. But because uh, we see that God is wisdom, and because God is wisdom, then we should take and make every effort to become wise also. You know, uh, Christians, the, the term Christian came about literally meaning little Christs. And that was, it was, it was initially thought to be kind of a negative term. Uh, you know, uh, I remember a lot of times when I rode with my dad, he was a, a route salesman, a milkman, and because uh, he was a single parent at the time, and, and uh, his boss allowed me to ride uh, with him during the summer months so he didn't have to get a babysitter. And, and uh, there was a number of the proprietors at the businesses he went to that called me Little Joe, just Little Joe. And Becky says, the older I get, the more I look like little Joe, you know. And, and, and so God is that way. Now, we should become wise like him. I mean, if, if my goal in life was to be half the man my dad was, I would have been very successful. And I'm thankful for his influence in my life. So as we continue our series, uh, the, the Way of Wisdom from the book of Proverbs, the, uh, in these uh, verses... Uh, especially in the first four verses, you're going to find the word used at least three times, the word if. Now, I've always been told, I remember my grandmother saying this, if is a mighty big word. It's two letters, but it's a mighty big word. And so in the writings here, we see three times used the word if, if you do this, if, if, if. And, and we'll look at this. What this does is, because it's there three times, it amplifies and it implies that we must, uh, if we want wisdom, we must choose then to go after it. We've got to, we, it's out there for us. And so if we're going to get wisdom, we have to go after it. Uh, we've got to decide then to go after it. And, and we've got to consider it as valuable as gold and silver. And, uh, and, and in the end, wisdom is available if... We choose it. All right, let's get into this. Let's look at the first four verses tonight uh, as we begin our lesson here. And it says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thy ear unto, unto wisdom and apply thine heart unto understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures. And so we see there in verse number one, the address here in this chapter is to my son. Now, um, Proverbs is an educational book on wisdom. It, it, it's, it's an educational book. And if you were to go back in history, especially in Bible days, a lot of times a child was placed into the custody uh, of a so-called teacher or a master or a, uh, someone so they could be an apprentice to them. And so the address here is a very beautiful thought, uh, is my son. And I may have not been a blood relative, but a lot of times, and if, you, if you're online with any teachers right now that are not going to be able to go back this year, so many of them are lamenting the fact that they miss their little children. I miss my boys and girls. I miss them terribly. I would much rather, and you know, some are trying to encourage the parents, don't feel like failures in homeschooling. We'll get it straightened out back in September or August or September when we go back to school. So it's an educational book. And as students, um, we as students have sat through the lessons that were offered in chapter one, and now the great teacher, God himself, uh, has resumed the classroom. He has come back in and said, my children. You know, here we are, my son. He's, he's offering this to him, And so he, refu he, he refers to his pupil, pupils then as my son. Now, in Kaufman's commentaries on the Bible, uh, the, the phrase my son, he says, this address occurs 13 times in the first seven chapters of Proverbs. Now, when you stop and think about that, that would be like us going to 13 different classes, uh, each chapter being a class, 
and and uh, and in the first seven chapters, one my son, and then the second my son would indicate, okay, close that section out. Let's go into a new section. And so we're in this section now, here in chapter two, there in verse one. Now, this indicates that there is a unity of the sections. They come together, but yet they're different. But also it reveals the format here, uh, he says, as a succession of speeches to a young person by some teacher. Um, uh, my dear friend, and you remember Pastor Amsball, we just learned recently that uh, uh, he has been hired at Pensacola Christian uh, College there. He's going to be teaching both the college and at the seminary, probably more, I'd say probably more on the seminary side, get those master's and doctorate degrees that they offer. And, uh, you know, people remember his, they call them uh, modules, but they're just speeches, basically. They're, they're intensive educational things. Well, let's look at the first if there in Proverbs, uh, in, that, in that chapter number two. He says, if thou wilt receive my words. Now think about this. The Bible, we've been told this over and over and over again, and, and we probably paired it without ever thinking about it, but the Bible does have an answer for every question. Uh, there's not a question that the Bible can't answer, but you have to do the if. If thou wilt receive my words. I'm going to tell you the answer, but will you receive it? Yeah, you understand? I mean, you know, um, I listen very intently again, like I've done for so many weeks now, listening to our governor, hoping he would give some ray of light of, like, you know, what, t what day and what hour this will all be over. He didn't do it again today, you know. But I want to receive his words. I don't want to receive the fact that, oh, we might be tied up for a little bit longer and, and, and all like that. So the Bible has an answer for every question. The Bible addresses every situation, every problem, and every possibility we would face. The Bible is literally God's handbook for mankind. I mean, we have this resource here in front of us. We just have to learn how to use it, and we have to be willing then to receive the words of God. Uh, I remember one time dealing with a soldier, and uh, at some point he just looked at me and said, I don't care what the Bible says, I feel like this. And I thought, son, you're, you're in a bad state if that's the way you really feel. You understand what I'm saying? Because your feelings are, are, we'll get into that Sunday, by the way, in our message. And, uh, but our feelings can't be trusted sometimes. You know, I mean, I've got up in the morning feeling terrible. I didn't have a good night's sleep. I felt, I felt wore out, drugged out, whatever it might be. And all of a sudden, the next thing I know, it's ready for bedtime at night. And I've accomplished more than I'd accomplished if I'd gotten up all bright and vigor. You can't trust your emotions. Now, so we often then refer to the Bible as God's word. And because it's God's word, everything we need is found in the Bible. But there is a qualifier. There's always a qualifier, and the word is if. Now, what he's saying here is, all knowledge and wisdom then is laid out before us in the pages of the Bible, but our duty, our responsibility, it's our job then to, um, to be able to receive the words of God. That's why uh, when uh, we study the Word of God, maybe perhaps one of our prayers should be as, Lord, show me something today and help me to be able to receive what you give me, even if I don't like it. Even if it isn't what I want to hear, I want to do your will. Isn't that what Christ prayed in the garden? Not my will, but thine be done. I mean, if I had my way, we'd, we'd pack this place out even on Wednesday night. If I had my will, you understand, we would do things a lot differently than doing it online. But we don't get to have our will. It's, it's God's will that must be done. Now, the word receive uh, means to use. And so not only is it that I get it, but now I want to use it. That's the practical application. You know, one of the things as we uh, begin to talk to uh, new ministers and preachers that are coming along is, is that take the passage and make an application to it. What, how does this apply to the hearer's life? Make it simple so that they can grasp it one little thing at a time. If you were to buy a little puppy and you were going to train that little puppy, you do one command at a time. 
you know, and you've got it over and over and over and over again, and you make the application so that they'll finally learn it. It means not only to receive, but to accept it, and that, that's different than just receiving it. It means I accept it, and I will use it. The word receive means to take. What can I take away from this? Uh, how do I buy into this? What is the carry away? Uh, I had a, a fella uh, that was a real friendly guy when we were in the military, and uh, his favorite phrase was, if he's talking to you about doing something, he'll say, now we need to touch base on this. And so later on, he became Sergeant Touch Base. Let's, let's go talk to Sergeant Touch Base. But what it was is he was trying to lay out before us what would be the carryaway. What can we take away from what we're going to do? What, what's the, the purpose and all like this? The word receive it also means to enfold and to seize. Uh, one of the things about baking is, is sometimes it will tell you to fold in. You know, if you need to put, uh, for instance, vanilla in something, and it, it'll say gently fold it in. And what that means is to incorporate it I into that. Now, all knowledge and wisdom, and by the way, you can have knowledge but not have wisdom. But you'll notice that most of the time when, when the Bible speaks of having knowledge, it adds wisdom with it. That means not only do I know the facts and figures, but I know how to use them. Stand back, I'm locked and loaded, right? Now, so, uh, you know, in, in order to do this, to, to get wisdom from the Word of God, we, we need to discover the path that's literally clearly marked out in this verse. The first thing is, is to if. That means we need to choose. The second uh, part of the path is, is to receive, which he says, receive my words, which means we need to use them correctly. And then the third, it tells us in that passage, is to hide my commandments. We're to hide my commandments. Now, John Gill, in his commentary, said this. It means when we hide the commandments, that means we, we look at them, we try to memorize them, or we try to have a working knowledge of them. We've got them tucked away. Uh, you know, uh, now, I don't know if they even teach this in driver's ed, but do you all remember when you had to learn that meant a left turn and that meant a right turn and that meant slow down? You know, I don't even know if they teach that anymore, but I can remember I had to hide those things. In the Army, I was so deathly afraid. I, I, I was a late bloomer. I, I couldn't tell you left from right most of the time. And in the Army, when they call what they call cadence to march, they always start you out on the left foot. And if they started calling left, my thumb would go up down here. To this day, my wife says, now you get up here and turn left. My thumb goes up. It's hid. It's just part of who I am. It's there. I've used it for so long. And so he tells us to hide his commandments. So John Gill says that in order to hide his commandments, we have to have a high esteem of them. We need to think highly of the Bible. It, and he says to have a high esteem of them, the words of God, and a hearty affection and value for them. You know, later on it talks about uh, finding this treasure, seeking it like silver and gold, and that's treasure. You know, we're all waiting for, if you've not received it like Becky and I, we're waiting on the government to give us our little bit of treasure that'll last about a minute and a half once, <laughs> once it happens, right? You know, and we think we got something big over on them. But that's neither here nor there. Now, so we're to have high esteem, a hearty affection, and we are to value then the words of God. And, and if we'll do that, then we retain them in our memory. I'm not a big, uh, uh, I, I have a really tough time memorizing like passages of Scripture. But I get part bits and pieces enough that I know uh, I, I can eventually go back and at least find them and then show them. But, but we retain them in our memory. And we frequently, he says, and we frequently think of them, and then we meditate upon them. Now, the word meditate upon them means, how do I use this in my life? We, we make it a, a ritual. And then he says, not only do we meditate on them, we constantly then observe these commandments, these precepts, these words from God. Now, historically, Baptist churches have always held... And we, we even have this phrase in our Constitution and bylaws. We have a high view of the Word of God. 
I mean, it is our source. It is everything. We base everything on the Word of God. We are Bible. We are a Bible-believing church, and thus we hold the Word of God uh, at a high value. Now, wanting wisdom, we must hold near and dear to our life this high view of the Word of God. And if we can get that part down, then we too will begin to have wisdom. When the Bible tells us about uh, the, the beginning uh, of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, what that means is we've seen that in the Bible. And it's not a, I'm afraid of him, I have a reverence towards him, but I still don't want him to paddle me either. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I can see it coming. Now, so we've constantly, there's never a time can we ever just quit seeking wisdom. We have to seek it until the day we die, literally. We just don't stumble over it. We've got to seek it. Um, I know there's, a, uh, there's a herbs and different things out in the forest and mushrooms and different things that people have to go seek. And, and, and if, I were out, if I was one to go out not knowing anything about like ginseng or certain mushrooms, I'd just probably walk over top of them, never understand but there's value in those things uh, to the right person. And so we've got to, uh, to con continually uh, seek wisdom. We don't want to stumble over wisdom. We've got to seek it. And wisdom, though, is literally hiding. Now get this. I like this statement. Wisdom is hiding in plain sight. Now, I've asked Becky a lot of times. I'll look in the freezer. Where, where's the biscuits? They're there. Where at? She'll walk in, grab them, there they are. I don't know why I can't see them. I guess it's a guy thing, I don't know. Maybe my glasses have the wrong tint. I'm not sure exactly what it is. But, you know, they're hiding there in plain sight, and that's, that's a good thing. And so is wisdom. Wisdom is hiding in plain sight, and we know that it's found there in the Word of God. Now, he tells us to hide. Uh, the word here means to hide, to hide this commandment and hide wisdom within us. It means to be completely covered in. I thought that was an interesting definition for the word hide. Uh, if I'm going to be completely covered, I want to be completely covered in the Word of God. I want it to cover every aspect of my life. I want it to be uppermost. I want to hold that high view. But I also want it to be so intricately uh, related to me that it's just there. It, it means this, to hold in reserve. Do you, do you have a little bit of reserve somewhere in, in your wallet? Now, I, over the years, we've quit carrying cash for the most part. But I remember my brother. My brother had hidden in his wallet a $100 bill. He always had that $100 bill. That was his reserve money. And I know a lot of people have some reserve put back. And, and you know, we need to have the Word of God so part of us that we can look and say, I've got a little bit hidden just in case. That's my reserve money. And so uh, he tells us it's to hold in reserve then the words of God. Now, we... we uh, uh, we need to hide the word the, of God in us and uh, his commandments. It means this, to own as a protection. Um, when my wife got her pistol and when we were in uh, Georgia, there was a sweet little old lady that uh, was from Alabama, a southern bell woman, and a, a matronly, just proper and prim and she had uh, heard that Becky had a gun, and she slipped in on the pew, and she patted her on the knee, and she said, Honey, I've been accompanied for years. And, and you know what? That meant that she was hiding. Uh, you know, she was hiding a, a protection piece. Do you hide the Word of God so that you're protected? And, and, uh, and not only that, it means to hide means to lay up for future use. So I'm going to put that back for when I get a little older. Retirement is, is the same idea. Putting away a little bit now so that when retirement comes, I'll have a little bit more to go on. That's the way we should treat the Word of God. Now, verse 2 then carries on with the requirements for gaining wisdom. Look at verse 2. So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Now, this verse tells us that if we seek biblical wisdom, we've also got to incline our ear unto wisdom. 
Uh, we've been involved in a few churches that had good-sized choirs. And there was always a man, usually a man, not, very rarely was it a woman. They would, uh, maybe they were going to sing the bass part. And have you ever seen somebody singing and put their hand up like this? They put their hand up near their ear. They were trying to get their ear to hear the part. They were inclining. Uh, I do that with children. I uh, don't hear as well as I used to. And kids will say something. A lot of times I'll bend over to have them talk to me. I'll incline my ear. The word incline means to hearken to. That means I better know what is. You know, if you uh, back to that little old puppy that you, you had just purchased and you're trying to train, you call that puppy's uh, name, and all ears go, boom, they just go straight up, and they'll start looking for you. It means to attend to. Uh, you know, hey, I hear something. i got to take care of this right now. A mother does that with a newborn. She'll hear a little whimper or something, and she'll say, pardon me for a moment. I must attend to my child. It means to give heed. That means I'm willing and waiting and listening, and then when it's given to me, I'll do what I'm required to do. It means to regard. The word incline means to regard very highly. And now your ear. Now, uh, <laughs> The, the word ear in the Bible is not just this fleshly hunk of meat hanging off your head. It's really a compound word. It means to be able to listen and to do. Kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? And so I incline my ear. I'm listening with the intent that I will do that thing. And then the word apply. The word apply means to be stretched. Have you ever been stretched by something? Uh, have you ever learned a new um, hobby or you've learned a new uh, skill and it stretched you? Well, that stretched me. You know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't for sure. And so it means to be stretched. The word apply means to be a follower closely of. Remember, we're talking about a teacher that's uh, giving everything they got to the student. And a lot of times the student was there to be an apprentice so they would learn something. And it means... Do it this way. I, I've often told you about my friend that taught me uh, that we were good friends and he turned wood and he was left-handed and I'm right-handed. And, and I'm going to tell you something. It was very difficult some days to be a follower of what he was trying to teach me. I felt like I needed to hook my legs around the rafter and look at him upside down because it wasn't making a lick of sense to me. But we were stretched and I was trying to be a follower. The word apply means to be yielded to. To being yielded to. And the word yielded there means I'm on a path and I've got to get to where I'm better at it. And it's just like yielding onto a, a, a major road. You, you don't actually stop, but you merge and then go on with the flow. And that's exactly what God wants us as he begins to tell us these things. Now we're to incline our ear and apply and then we're to have some understanding. Again, that understanding word is a very important word here. The word understanding means to have discretion, to have discretion. And, and uh, you know, someone said that discretion is the better part of valor. But, you know, you might know everything, and you might need to be discreet about it. You know, you, you can walk up, and I've often used this illustration. You can, uh, let's see if I got one. I ain't got one. Yes, I do. You can, you can walk up, and I'll just use my wife because she can beat me later. Your breast stinks. Or I can say, here, how, how about a mint? She, she took my mint, too. I wasn't talking about her breath. You, you know, you got to have some discretion sometimes. You know, you, 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 know, you just got to be discreet about it. And that's wh how you get understanding. Now, if I'd have been serious about that, she'd have probably beat me upside the head, which would learn me to be a little more discreet next time. <laughs> well, I don't want to say it quite that way. It means to have reason. You know, the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, one of the greatest phrases is, come and let us reason together. And, and what that means is, let's talk this thing out. Let's figure out how we can incorporate that in the generality of our life. It means to, to, be, to have skillfulness. To be able to have skillfulness. You were talking about your cars, and, and, and they're not really doing all the work they're supposed to do at some of the dealerships. But isn't it nice to know that there are people that are skillful in something that I could care less about? I mean, to have skillfulness. Uh, the word understanding means then also to have uh, an understanding wisdom. To, to have the wisdom, but know how to use it through those things. Now, William MacDonald, in his commentary re referring to this, says this. There must be an open ear, 
and an open heart or mind. The student must be attentive, uh, must be an attentive listener, not a compulsive talker. He should listen to the wise advice of, a, uh, of others. And so the Lord's telling us, you're under my tutelage, learn from me. Now, look at Proverbs chapter 2 again, and let's look at verses 3 and 4. He says, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures. Now, in order to seek wisdom, verse 3 and 4 brings us to two additional choices, and we see the other two ifs. It says, If thou criest. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. When we cry to God, we get, uh, to give us the spirit of wisdom and, and, and revelation, Gill said, uh, in the knowledge of divine and spiritual things, which suppose some sense uh, of a want of it. What, what, is, what he's saying here is that when we ask God for wisdom, there must be a reason behind it. We, that, we, that we find something lacking in our life. We have that question that, that I've just proclaimed that the Bible has an answer for. God, I'm not seeing it. Can you show it to me? It, it, it's really, it, 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 we're crying, we're begging, we're pleading, we're asking, we're, we're, we're asking the teacher for a little more remedial help. Uh, you know, I, uh, I learned a little bit about remedial help when I was in high school because I was just a big slug, and, and so uh, if I, I didn't get all the work done during the normal years, I got to go to summer school a few times. I had to have some remedial education, and... Uh, I, I got it that time. Yeah, I got tired of sitting there during those summer months down in Florida, 190 degrees outside, and wasn't much cooler on the inside, and and uh, and they didn't have, always have air conditioning in some of our classes back in those days. Now I have a question: How bad do you want wisdom? How bad do you want wisdom? This is a key question. I believe that we can gauge the intensity of that desire by the intensity of how we cry out to God for knowledge. And knowledge and wisdom, or knowledge is wisdom also. Now, if thou criest, it means to lift up thy voice. And so the other question is, is how often? How often do we pray for wisdom? Do we pray for wisdom during this time of, uh, of lockdown? Do we pray for wisdom on what if? You know, I, I'm, I'm facing some medical procedures. Or we got some that are, and, you know, do I go? Do I not go? When do I go? How do I, you know, what do I do? And so how often do we pray for wisdom? Another gauge is to inventory how much time we spend in the Word of God digging out wisdom. Now, listen, it don't make you one bit more spiritual if you spend an hour and 32 minutes in the Bible than if you only spend five minutes. If, you're, if, if all you've got is five minutes, do as much digging in that five minutes as you can. Have you ever had a task around your house and you looked at your watch and you said, I got 10 minutes. That's normally a 30 minute job, but I bet you I can get her done. And you just get busy and you get her done and you still make your appointment and, you, and everything's done and man, you're a happy camper. The idea here is, is, is how much time do you spend in the Word of God digging out and studying and meditating upon the Word of God? And the Bible tells us there, and I ask the question, do you seek wisdom like men that seek silver or hid treasures? Um, I got into making uh, rings out of coins, and uh, that leads you into coin collecting. I'm not, I'm not a coin collector, but there's people that will go into a place and they'll they'll buy a, like a silver dollar, an old silver dollar from way back when, and and uh, the guy won't realize what it is, and they'll get it home, and they paid eight bucks for it, and it's really worth thirty. You know, they they found a treasure. <coughs> the next thing we look at in verses five through eight is the source of wisdom. So we're to cry out for wisdom. But we also want to make sure we're at the right source. And, and I know I'm ahead of the game here, but we're, we're going to find that wisdom is only found in the Bible. Look at verse number 5. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. 
Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way <coughs> excuse me, of his saints. Becky, would you go get me a little water, please? Thank you very much. <laughs> Got a dry voice tonight. Hope that I don't have coronavirus. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if I use the word biblical wisdom, we could also use it, and the Bible refers to this as pure wisdom, okay? So biblical or pure wisdom we know is found in the Bible. Now, when we discover the methods of digging the treasures from the pages of the Word of God, wisdom will benefit us beyond anything or any measurement we could possibly have. And by the way, there are so many ways to study the Bible. Uh, I like to look at words. I like to look at definitions of words. I like to look through a concordance and get the idea of what, it, what other words could be a descriptor for that particular word used in a particular verse. I like to read commentaries. And so there's all kinds of ways uh, to study. There's uh, various names for Bible study methods. And uh, whichever one works for you, just become a professional in it. It, 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 it just, just, but the idea is, is that you've got to figure out how and what works for you in, in digging treasures. You know, some people will use a very specific shovel if they're going to go after gold, for instance. Maybe even just a small spade like you'd use in a garden. Others want to go in there with a great big old backhoe with a big old bucket on it and dig, dig, dig. And they'll, we'll sort through it at the other end. We'll put it through a big machine. Just trying to mine it out. Whatever works for you really is what God is telling us to do. Now, when we, when we figure out that the Bible is our source for wisdom, we, we're going we're gonna to start digging out these treasures we're going to gain the proper fear of the Lord that he says there in verse number five. Uh, we want to have a proper fear of the Lord. We gain a better understanding of who Jesus is and what he expects uh, from us. Uh, when a man and woman, uh, they date and they're learning a little bit about each other, they're learning what likes and dislikes are, and then after they get married, they learn a little bit more, and as you progress through uh, many years of marriage, you still learn things that, oh, I guess I better not do that. Uh, you know, you, you learn what's expected in order to keep the relationship, and if it's mutual, it, it's really an easy thing to do. Now, the good thing about the Lord is he told us that his burden is not heavy, you know, it's light, and so he puts on what he expects of us in a way that we can grasp it, and as we mature, we get more and more of it. Now, so we'll gain the proper fear of the Lord. Uh, we gain a better understanding of who he is and what he expects from us. Now, the source of wisdom then produces in us an intimate knowledge of God. The only way, I mean, listen, I love you coming to church. I can't wait till we meet again. I'd like you to bring every neighbor you can possibly bring, fill this place to overflowing. We, I want to pack it so so tight in here that the coronavirus couldn't even breathe. You know, I mean, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? But the idea here is, is that once we get the source of wisdom and we've dug out some treasures on our own, we get an intimate knowledge of God. Again, the, the marriage of a man and woman are, are uh, the, the, the more you know about each other, the more intimate your relationship becomes. And we're not even talking about it in a sexual way, although that might be included. We're talking about it just becomes my left hand and your left hand, my right hand and your right hand. It becomes an intimate knowledge. I know what you're thinking before you ever say it. You know, the, the longer you've been married, you can almost look at each other and know what the other one's going to say. Occasionally you, you might be wrong, but not often. Now the source of wisdom then produces that intimate knowledge. Now we also know that the Lord gives wisdom. The Lord gives us wisdom. The Bible tells us there that uh, there in verse 6 that he uh, giveth wisdom and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. And, and then in verse 7 he tells us to lay up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walketh or walk uprightly. 
He keepeth the path of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. The word layeth there means hoarding up in reserve for us. Andrea and I, as we go around to the various closets and the various things, we talk about being Baptist hoarders. I mean, uh, we cleaned out a four-drawer filing, a five-drawer filing cabinet a, lo- a while back, a couple of, three or four years ago, and the two bottom drawers were filled with cassette tapes. I don't know, other than Dallas Cochran, I don't know anybody <laughs> that still has cassette tapes you could play. Now, you might have one at home. Well, I would have taken them. We tried to give them away. Uh, when Miss Hugert passed away, her daughter put in our car, I don't know how many boxes of cassette tapes. And uh, we tried to give them away and tried to give them away. And finally, we gave them away to the guy that comes early morning on Wednesday before daylight, and he hauled them away in a nice truck to, to some landfill. And so the word layeth means to hoard up in reserve for us. The word layeth means that God, he protects our wisdom. He has laid up in secret his wisdom for our use. You can see that in those passages there. Uh, A man by the name of Coverdale in his commentary says this, He preserveth the welfare of the righteous. And then we find there in in verse 7, uh, he, he says, he is a buckler to them that walk upright. It's not a word that we normally use in our modern day language. But the word buckler there, uh, in the Old Testament in particular, you would get the picture, uh, a warrior, a king, or, or uh, someone of, of stature would uh, go to war, and they would, they would usually hire a younger man, a child, a teenager, who wasn't very tall, and he would carry a big shield. Uh, it would be about the size of a door, if you will. And that would be that buckler. He would be the first line of defense. And even if the warrior himself had a smaller shield to deflect, obviously he couldn't have that full door carrying because he would need to shoot his bow and arrow. And so that's exactly what this means. Uh, the word buckler means he's our shield. When when it talks about God, this is all referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And since the Word of God is that this is our protection too. It means He's our protector. The Word of God is our protection. And it's our defense. And the Word of God is our ruler. Because it is God's Word. Now, because God is all that for us, it it is He that keeps the path of judgment. We we see that in verse 8. You see, we don't have to do all this. This is God's responsibility to us. He that keeps the path of judgment, and he preserves our way. And and that means the the, the way for us to go according to his will. Well, let's look at the benefits of of wisdom, and we'll we'll go a little bit longer tonight, and then we'll we'll be done. Now, uh, verse 9 through 11. It says, Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. Now God has a desire for us then to seek biblical or godly wisdom. It's our responsibility. We, We established that in the very beginning of this chapter. So we must, as his children, we must, we must, we must be in the word of God daily. I mean, it, it, it is our vitamin C. It's our, it, it's our B12 shot for that morning. Um, you know, it's, it's a known fact. The closer we draw to the Lord, the Bible says he'll draw to us. And, the, and since God and his word is wisdom, the closer we draw to him, the more wisdom we have access to. Now, wisdom has many benefits. Let's look at these. It, it, here, here we see, we'll understand righteousness. Thou shalt understand righteousness there in verse 9. You know, what is right? What is God's righteousness? How do we relate to it and how do we understand it? The more time we spend in the Word of God, the more wisdom to understand what God expects of us by way of righteousness. And He imputes to us His right. He gives us His righteousness. We also get to understand judgment. Listen, it, uh, just because somebody gets away with messing us over doesn't mean that, that you know, maybe the law didn't catch them or the law didn't care. God still gets to judge them. We'll understand there's a bigger judgment yet to come. 
and we'll understand equity. You know, sometimes we don't think it's fair. Uh, I haven't gotten my stimulus, and if you've got yours, it ain't fair. You know, <laughs> you know it just ain't fair. But I'm going to tell you something. God has a purpose in this, and there is an equity, and, and we'll understand it in the by and by, as the song would tell us. We also recognize, uh, we, or we will recognize, I should say, uh, it tells us every good path. Now, if God is leading us day by day, don't you think he, whatever path he takes us down will be a good path? Do you, do you ever think you're not on the right path? Do you ever think that, hey, this illness is, has, has blindsided me? But, but then afterwards, I mean, when, when Becky got diagnosed with a brain tumor, I thought, what in the world is going on? But many years afterwards, and God's grace was so sufficient, we look back and say, that was God's perfect plan. That was his plan and his path. And it was a good path. What, do I want to go back down it? No, but it was good to go down it when I did go down it. And so we'll recognize then the things in our life as, as God's very good uh, path. Clark, in his commentary, said this, He who is taught of God understands the whole law of justice, mercy, righteousness, and truth. God has written this on his heart. He who understands these things by books only is never likely to practice or profit by them. That's why we think the Word of God is so important. We hold such a high view. It's a living book. It speaks to our situation in the moment that we find ourselves in. Gill said this, This is another benefit and effect of the Word of God and of the spiritual understanding of it, that besides the knowledge of God and how to behave with reverence towards Him, it leads men into a notion of doing that which is right and just among other men. Now, um, we'll, uh, we'll stop there and uh, we'll pick up and uh, finish up next uh, week, Lord willing, at verse 10. And, uh, but it's been good to understand that God has a plan for our life. God has wisdom for us as we live our daily life. And really, if we just take the time to to dig a little bit, even like in the Proverbs and, of course, other places throughout Scripture, we can get these things. Well, let's uh, go into our prayer time now. And uh, we want to do pray for a few things that are going on. Continue to pray for um, Judy Hilton's daughter. I have not got any kind of update. I apologize. Uh, you didn't hear anything, did you, Becky? Pray for her daughter. I know if anything drastic would have taken place, um, we would have heard some more. Uh, pray for Lisa and Mike Hess. Uh, they're still battling, trying to get settled in. And uh, Thankfully, I guess it's a thankfulness. Cora said this to Becky last night. Um, Lisa's kind of in a laid-off position, so that's given her more time. And I guess because they laid her off, she's able to, to qualify for the... Uh, extra money and stuff that's coming in too. So pray for them. Pray that they get the appointment there in fast order if he is eligible for a lung transplant and the various things that need to go on there. So pray for uh, the uh, uh, Mike Hess family. What else do we need to be praying for? What am I missing? Continue to pray for uh, Jean's uh, family. Her brother passed away and uh, they've got to deal with that all during this confusing time too so pray for Jean's extended family on the pa uh, passing of her brother okay what Becky just said if you didn't hear her was is that um, Raleigh Care Center there in Beaver was slated to be tested today, all the residents and all the workers for the virus. And uh, a lot of that will, uh, they're saying it could take up to, what, six more weeks to get a lot of the results. And then it might be four to six weeks before they can have visitors. Now, um, that's, uh, you know, the, uh, I want to thank the nursing home there. They've been able to get Facebook and the family can actually talk with um, we were told that um, um, Dorothy's granddaughter got to take a guitar in 
and Dorothy's been singing with them. Amen. And so she remembers the songs. Amen. And so she's been able to use, and it's not her guitar. Her guitar is worth a few dollars. It's kind of one that if it got beat up, is it's not too bad. But we were told that she's able to sing. And then Tom and them, they've not been able to do much more than through the Internet talk to his mom uh, during this time. And I don't know, that place has a lot of folks there. Um, so pray for the, the nursing home there as they get tested. And uh, pray for Eric Murphy's family uh, on the home going of his mother. Uh, we posted the obituary, and I guess there's still not a lot of plans on exactly what they're going to do. They'll probably have a memorial service at some point. I've, uh, just so you know, those of you that are listening, we reached out to Eric and uh, through an email and offered him uh, whatever assistance that we could you know, come up with reasonably uh, if he needed uh, a place to stay or some travel expense. And I'm still waiting to hear back from him on that. But we have reached out to our missionary uh, with that. And so to do pray for the Murphy family on the home going of Eric's mom. I guess they, she used to come to church here. Is that right? Anything else? Yes. Ray, yes. Ray, yeah, Ray and uh, Brenda. And who? You said Connie. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'll get it. Pray for Ray Testerman and uh, Brenda, of course, and then pray for Connie and uh, Wayne. Uh, she's in recovery. And uh, she's online. I mean, she's on Facebook. If you'll, if you'll ask her to be your friend, you probably communicate. She, she responds to a number of our posts uh, by liking them. She doesn't really type a whole lot, but I'm thankful for that. And uh, do pray for all of our members. I hope you're doing that on a regular basis. You know, we've got the gambit of uh, feelings about this uh, coronavirus stuff. Uh, it runs from, man, I wish they'd get this over with, to like, I don't know when I'll come back out. And so I understand, and you know what? Nobody's right, nobody's wrong. And, uh, and uh, we're, we're trying to decide what to do at our church if and when they open it up. You know, will we go back to a full slate of schedule? I don't know. We haven't gotten that far down the road. You know, uh, we're already taking as many precautions with uh, sanitary cleaning, and duty does a great job there. And, and um, the other day we had someone that... Uh, uh, was taking care of some things around the building and they actually came in twice. I think he ended up wiping everything down three or four times. I mean, he touched it again. <laughs> so she wiped it back down again. Obviously, we'll, we'll probably, when you come back in, masks are just going to be one of those things if you choose to wear it. And if you're not feeling well, if, if when we get to meet again, we'll do that. There'll be hand sanitizer floating around and different things. But do pray that God would give us wisdom. Uh, and, uh, and again, we've not been backed into a corner. Our governor is still allowing for, you know, if you feel comfortable, come on. If you don't, don't. And that's all I'll say about that. We do have enough room that we can spread out and, uh, and uh, far enough that it shouldn't be a thing. Just make sure that you, if, if you don't want to be touched, make sure you throw your elbow up or say, no, don't want to be touched. And that's the way it goes. But do pray for Ray and Brenda and Connie and Wayne during this time. What else? Anything else we need to be praying for? All right. Yes, we uh, had someone drop off a secret sister gift, and uh, Mary fell again, hurt her shoulder. Pray for Mary that she'd stay up on her feet. Good night. She don't need to be falling. And yes, yeah, Mary wills. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we got to see her for a few moments. Um, we told her we were coming, and uh, there was a fence between us, so she was able to come out and talk. Same thing with Judy. We saw Judy Hilton uh, about a week ago, I guess it was, and we took her uh, uh, something, and uh, no, actually picked up something from her, and uh, she was able to stay up near the porch, and we were able to see her for a few moments, and we've had a few people that were able to see by way of them dropping off uh, offerings and so forth, and uh, do pray for our folks, uh, all of our people, and uh, that God would give us more wisdom about when when to come back. Anything else? All right, Steve, would you take us to the throne of grace, sir? <laughs>